The biggest debate that we had post-production, we were a divided group about cutting that scene out. And half of us wanted it in and half of us didn't. And I was desperate to keep that scene in. I carried this horrible thing with me alone for years. And it has built up this rage inside of me. Honey, get out! Don't touch me! The film takes on some very heavy, challenging topics. Were you intimidated at all when you first signed on? I wasn't. I don't know what that makes me, but I wasn't. I was really excited to play a character that had two versions of her true self. Neither one was a lie. They were both a version of who she was, and I thought that that was really interesting. And I looked at the incidents as just a puzzle piece to a mystery. I don't know what's me. I'm what part I invented. You and Mila play versions of the same character. Did you two sync up beforehand to talk about it? Oh yeah, I mean, I was a huge Mila Kunis fan before I ever attached myself to the movie, obviously. I mean, everyone is. But kind of beforehand, we connected and we were able to like meet over Zoom and kind of talk about Ani and the character, which was wonderful. And, you know, she spent a lot of time kind of you know, talking with me and talking about, you know, mannerisms and the voice and the sound and kind of, you know, who we wanted Ani to be as a whole, which was awesome. I said, ow. I just remember I was saying, ow. How was working with Kiara and Mila throughout the whole process? We were having dinners together, barbecues together, you know, going, Kiara and I went shopping together, like every weekend. <laughs> but yeah, those two hold me up. They don't have kids and a family. They were like, do you want to go out? And I was like, yo, I have my family here. I have kids. I got soccer practice. I got to go. Like, it was summertime for my kids. So they were living their best lives. And my husband and I were Ubering our children around Toronto. <laughs> and Mila, as a creative producer, really added so much value to the point where we were all, when we had approached her, we were all a little stuck on the third act. Like, we couldn't quite... We couldn't quite nail it down and she was the one who read it and was like, I'm engaging, I love this, but I think we've got to like work on a few things and here's my perspective and just really kind of helped us push it uh, just over the finish line. Excuse me, I'm so sorry. I, I would love to stay in touch, but I already forgot your name. Oh, it's Sarah. Oh, that's okay. I'll just always remember you as the woman I told to go herself on Fifth Avenue. The biggest debate that we had post-production was whether we were a divided group about cutting that scene out. And half of us wanted it in and half of us didn't. And I was desperate to keep that scene in. It was a point of contention um, in one of the screenings, like one of the test screenings we did. Of all the things in the movie, this scene, the one moment that we're talking about, that one sentence had a very polarizing effect on people. How did you push it through? because uh, I'm like a bull in a china shop. No, I, you know, it's a matter of uh, genuinely justifying. I was like, I'm desperate for this character to have like vindication. This is her one moment of being who she truly is outwardly. And I was like, in, in, if this movie was 20 minutes ago, then that is a piece of dialogue that would have been in her head because she would be too scared to ever say it out loud. And for the first time in her life, she is saying her inner dialogue out loud. You have to allow her to have that moment. But it's interesting that you pointed to that. It's one sentence. We're talking about one sentence. Yes. Is that the message that you want people to experience, that kind of empowerment? I hope so. I think that people are empowered by their flaws, and I hope that people are empowered by their past, because we all have a messy past. All of us are wrinkled. We're all a little torn. We all have history that's beautiful and great that makes us who we are today. And let's live with it and move past it and grow with it and all of that. So I do hope that people walk away with that. How dare anyone believe I did what Dean said I did while wiping away a single tear with this hand in particular. Why was it so important for you to have such creative control and write the screenplay? Well, I'm a control freak. I have issues. Um, <laughs> and so I think a lot of it was like, I can't imagine anyone else touching this. And I think also a big part of it was like a lot of my own story is embedded in Luckiest Girl Alive and within the character. And it just felt like a really important part of like my own process in just dealing and thinking about everything that happened to me to be able to like write this version of it as well. Um, and then it just, I ended up falling in love with screenwriting. It's just my, I mean, I, sorry if my publishers at Simon & Schuster hear this, but it's my favorite way of, of writing now. I really love sitting down, the idea of like visualizing the scene, seeing that materialize 
on film, it's really magical. When you were revisiting it, was there anything that you were excited to update or change? The third act of the film is kind of picks up where the novel less leaves off in incorporating real life elements of my own um, that happened in the year after the book published where I did myself write an essay for Lenny, Lena Dunham's Lenny Letter, it's no more, but it was a, a wonderful website and I published an essay saying that the sexual assault that had happened to Ani in the book was what had happened to me in real life. And it had a big response. I heard from lots of women. I went on the Today Show, just like she goes on the Today Show. So we incorporated those real uh, life elements into the film. This is Ani. Nice to meet you. Mr. Larson, it's me. Tiffany. Ani is such a strong character. What is your favorite aspect about her? Ah, favorite thing about Ani. I mean, that's hard. I think her kind of motivation to push through and be able to kind of live on in her life and succeed and achieve her goals, you know, despite the trauma that she's experienced from, you know, such a young age. Who helped you through most of that process when it came to those heavy scenes? Was it Jessica Knoll specifically? I mean, Jessica Knoll is fantastic. Like, I could not say enough good things about her. I mean, she's wonderful, but I mean, everyone. And um, we had so many incredible, like, female producers and writers and, you know, everyone on set. And also Mike Barker, who's our director, and he's incredible and fantastic. And we kind of developed, you know, a friendship and a relationship over the course of filming and we were able to, you know, I was able to feel really comfortable and secure in an environment when we were filming things that were so dark and difficult. I mean, it's all about trust. And so what I do is I just, I write to them and I, I, I literally write a promise of what I'm going to do and what I'm going to see and how I'm going to handle it. And then we sort of work out what that is and then you stick to it. You don't ever get tempted to change it on the day. You just stick to it. So everyone always feels safe. I hope that people feel compelled to share their stories, to talk about what happened to them and to know that you have nothing to be ashamed of.